Okay, we're continuing with uh, production function functions from the last video, and I mentioned uh, we can use Excel to model this uh, this this function and and do some what if analysis with it. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you the uh, the output, and then we'll go into Excel, and I'll we'll, we'll actually go through the process. So one really valuable tool that is within Excel that you know isn't uh, often used, or most, most people don't know about it, I don't think, um, is this two-way table function. So we can create a table that looks like this. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to go into Excel and show you how to create this table, and, and we'll take a look at the variables and what they mean. Okay, so this, I've set this up in Excel, uh, where the, the, the model is, is implemented here. So the M values, just initial values, um, A values are down here. We've calibrated this using regression. And then Y is, is calculated using the, um, these, these values, right? So um, A2 times uh, M to the, to the A1 uh, times N to the A2. Here it is. So using this, this two-way table is, is really a valuable way of looking at what-if scenarios. So uh, the way this works is you set up a table with M and N values, like this, or X and Y values, or X and, X1, X2 values, it doesn't matter how, what you call them. And in the upper left-hand corner, we're going to reference the output. Okay. And then using the uh, two-way function we'll, we'll um, highlight the uh, table the interior of the table I think that's how it works well uh, we'll see if that works or not and then we go to data the data tab and the what if scenario and go to data table and the um, the row input, so I'm going to fill in the rows, I'm going to fill in the rows underneath N. So N is my row input cell, and M is my column input cell. Uh, no, 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 okay, that didn't work. All right, hold on here, hold on. We'll take care of this. I always forget. So we have to highlight the whole table because it makes it actually makes sense. It needs to know what you're referring to. So here we, let's try that again. We'll highlight the whole table. Go to what if scenarios, data table. And the row input again is N. And the uh, column input is M. I'm going to fill in the columns based on these, these numbers. And there we are. So what these numbers mean is, if we plugged in 5 for N and 10 for M, then um, the value, the Y value, would be 18.2. And we could actually, um, we can actually do that. So 10 and 5, you see the, uh, the value is 18.2. And so it's a nice, nice what-if uh, scenario. And we can plot this if we want to. This is a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool thing. Um, let's take a look at charts. And if we go to the 3D surface chart, come out with a 3D chart that looks like this. Uh, if we want to... Um, So the series are the um, are the uh, the uh, the m values right under under n. So series one is this 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 first one here. So if I want the uh, category to be labeled here, I can do that. And that labels uh, labels the thing, and then the values in the table are just uh, along the uh, y-axis here. So that's a nice that's a nice um, 
thing to be able to do. Right? Okay, so let me go back to the uh, slides here. So we've got this two-way uh, table function. Nice to, to be able to do what if scenarios with this, as I mentioned. And we can do the 3D surface chart, which is nice to, for presentation purposes. So, production functions, as I said, typically deductive models, typically the Cobb Douglas, we'll be using the Cobb Douglas for anything that we do. You know, we're able to uh, optimize and so forth. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the characteristics of production functions. And, and you know, kind of dispel any anxiety about this jargon. Okay, so this first thing, uh, isoquants, all that means is... Uh, if you have a 3D function as we do, right, so two independents and one output, the isoquant is just a contour line of that surface. For, so if we set Y to a particular value and then look at the curve that intersects that, that 3D function, that's an isoquant, it's a contour. So I've, I've actually plotted our, our function, um, M and N, in, the, uh, in this XY plane, or this, I guess it would be an XY plane, and then the Z value is the, the output, the Y. And these lines are just um, contour lines of that function for given constant values of output. So... Let's say I want a constant value of y. Uh, as uh, I want to see the isoquant, what does it look like at y equals 25? Well, that's a pretty easy thing to do, right? We can just um, set it up so that, you know, slightly differently. So one of the, uh, the input variables is the variable, and y is the constant term. So by the way, this function right here is wrong. I'll show you the correct one. I'm going to actually go into Excel again here. Let's go to this demo. So I'm going to set the, I've set this up here already. Um, I don't think I can get, no, I can't. Never mind. I thought maybe I could um, zoom in here. No, I can't zoom in. It's not allowing me to zoom in here, but that's okay. Um, so this is the m function, and you can see up here, it's just, uh, I just solved for m, that's all. Not a big deal, right? So um, now I've set this up, and what I'm going to do is do a one-way table. So I'm going to reference the m value, and then, and then be able to vary the n values. This is just a, I mean, you could, you could do it in different ways, but... Um, you could set up a formula with n and blah, 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 but it's easier to do it this way, uh, although you wouldn't know it from all the talking I'm doing, but really it's just, uh, if it's easy to set this up. Uh, we can go to the data, what if, data table, and we're going to do just the column. We're going to fill in a column, right? So the column variable is n. We don't have a row variable because it's only a one-way table. So there you are. That's it. So if we were to plug 3, for example, into n, you can see that it's 61.4, right? And that's, uh, that's it for that. It's uh, pretty straightforward. Now, if I wanted to do a, a, a plot of this isoquant, this contour, I could um, simply go to charts and do a, maybe a, a smooth line scatter. I, you know, I have to play with the titles and all that stuff, but basically this is, this is uh, M and this is N. So I can find uh, information about the isoquant uh, here. And we'll come back to that in a second, but that's what it looks like. That's what the contour looks like at, at y equals 25. And you can see in, this, in the slides I had already done this and made it a little uh, neater. 
here. So what is a marginal product? So we can use this isoquant. We'll come back to that. So a marginal product is really, you know, what is the change in output if we change uh, one resource? How much will the, the output change? Right, so that's, that's really just the, 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 the change in output with respect to some one resource, x sub i. That's called the marginal product. So we can do an analysis of, well, if we change x so much, how much will the y change? You know, which ones should we change and so forth, right? This is a, a very useful, um, useful idea. So in general, we have this, the function again, our, our, our same function. Uh, let's say I want to do uh, dy dx3, right? x3 is the variable. Take a look at this, what happens with the, um, with the, with the first derivative here. With respect to x3, that's the only one that gets affected, right? Well, look at that. See, I can pull this, I can pull that x3 to the minus 1 out in front. And now, if you take a close look at that, really all that is is just the marginal product of x3 is just the, uh, the output function, the original output function, times this ratio. That's all it is. So that, that's another reason to use this uh, Cobb-Douglas formula. It's really easy to do these manipulations. So if, uh, if A3 is less than 1, then there will be diminishing, diminishing marginal products. And I'm going to show you, demonstrate this in a, in a sec. Okay. So let's say that um, for N equals 10, let's say the uh, marginal, well, I, I can find the marginal product for M at n equals 10 is, uh, is, is 1.26. And then I can, I can plot that using the one-way data table for different values of m. This is what happens. This is the marginal product. And look how it decreases. So we have a de decreasing marginal product as m increases. So as M increases, decreasing marginal product. What if M reduces, how much would we need to increase N to make up for it? So that for that, we need this rate of substitution. So for Y equals 25, that along this isoquant, I said we'd come back to this, dm dn is the marginal rate of substitution at this point in the production function. So for any given level of output, we can find um, you know, different, different rates of substitution. So the easiest way to find this is use the, to use the marginal product. So we know this is these are the marginal products. If we put them together, you can see the ratio of the marginal products. The inverse ratio of the marginal products is, is equal to the rate of substitution. So, in our example, marginal product of M is this. Marginal product of N is this. If we plug those in, this is the, uh, the, the rate of substitution in general. And we know it's negative, right? We just looked at it. We saw that it was going to be a negative number, right? So uh, if, if n is 10 and m is 5.5, for example, then the rate of substitution is minus 1.1. So uh, for any unit change in n, we would need to expect a change in, in 1.1 in M to keep Y constant. 
Now, there's another idea that's really um, valuable, and it, it relates to um, um, economies of scale somewhat. We'll get into that later, but this is the returns to scale. If we were to increase our inputs by a factor of s, how would y change? Would it change by a factor of s? Would it be something less, something more? It depends. Okay. Again, depends upon the a values. So, but the returns to scale, we're going to take a look at this, how to find it. So let's say we change all the, the inputs by a factor of s, some scale. And the returns to scale is the actual number versus s, uh, a scale of s changed by a, a, a factor of s. So if we plug in the numbers here, we have something that looks like this. And we can take this and factor out the s values, and it looks like this. So if we if we come over here and 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 and, and use the uh, solve for y plus over y, come up with this value. So this ratio, this returns to scale, is equal to the scale raised to the summation. So what does that mean? Well, let's take a look. So if the summation of A is greater than 1, then we have a positive returns to scale. Let's go back. Okay. So the returns, if we factor, if we increase by a factor of s all of the inputs, if we have a positive returns to scale, then y increases more than the s. In our example, the summation of a values is 0.4 and 0.8, right? 1.2. Right? So the, the production function has an increasing returns to scale as a, a, according to this. Well, so let's take a look at the values and see if that's true. So if we bring in that two-way contingency or that con two-way table again, <coughs> <coughs> If we start with a value for n of 5 and a value for m of 10, this is the output value. Let's double them. Let's go to 20 and 10. Well, the output more than doubles. If we double them again, 40 and 20, look, the output more than doubles. Right. So we have a positive returns to scale in this particular model. This is a good thing. All right, so we're going to take a break here.